Hi, good evening. Welcome to our Bible study on Job. Welcome to our investigation of the mystery of suffering. Uh, trying to come bring about some sort of understanding into this whole subject now. What I want to deal with this evening, um, the next section in the book of Job goes from chapter 11 to chapter 14, and it's Zophar versus Job and the discussion that they have. And um, this will bring to an end the first round of speeches that we have in Job. Now, I'm not going to deal with all three of those, four of those chapters, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. I'm just going to deal basically with chapter 11 this this evening, but it's a part of the of that whole thing of Zophar speaking to Job. So we're starting with, with Zophar, first of all. Now, what we read of in in um, in chapter chapter one. Um, uh, let me just let me just say this: that when Zophar speaks, and he's the last of the three friends of Job to to speak right now, and he brings to an end the first round of arguments. And this is the first speech that Zophar makes, and he makes three points. His first point is a rebuke. He rebukes Job for what he considers to be idle words. And then the second um, point that he makes is his praise, where he expresses praise for God's wisdom. And then the, the third point that he makes is his plea to Job to repent. I think this is the one thing that concerns them both. And I think you need to remember, I mentioned this before, I want to remind you of it, that both his friends and Job thought that Job's life was coming to an end and that it was coming to an end rather rapidly. And so there's a sense of urgency that they have. Job, you need to repent. You need to get right with God so that when your life comes to an end, it will be good for you. So, Zophar starts with a with a rebuke, and I'm reading from verse 1 in the ESV once again, the um, English Standard Bible, and this is what we read. Then Zophar, the, the Naamamite, answered and said, Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and a man full of talk be judged right? Should your babble silence men? And when you mock, should no one shame you? For you say, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in the eyes of the Lord. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for he is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Now, Zophar rebukes Job, first of all, for his what he calls his many idle words. And we read this in verse 2. And um, we, um, there seems to be a problem that these guys have with Job's words. And, and Job is rather verbose. He does say a, a lot of stuff, um, more than what they've said. I, I suppose that's true. But um, the... The, the 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 big thing is that they this is what he says should a multitude of words go unanswered and a man full of talk be judged right he is drawing attention to the fact that job is full of words he got a lot to say but he doesn't believe that the that what job is saying is really really worth too much and then he also rebukes job for for his mocking, he 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 says this in in the second verse. Sorry, verse third verse. He said, "Should your babble silence men, and when you mock, shall no man shame you?" He's saying to Job, "You you got many words, and they're idle words. They're not really worth anything, and um, and you you mock us in what we're trying to say. You make a joke of what we're trying to do." And then in verse 4, Zophar rebukes Job for his boast that he is pure before God. Because, as we read, Job actually says, but, but you say, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. He's saying, 
I'm rebuking you for this because this is really not true. And then Zophar agrees with Job in wanting to speak to God. He says this in verse 5, But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you. He just felt that it would be a very good thing if Job could have this conversation with God that he was wanting, because then something would happen. He said, first of all, God would reveal his manifold wisdom to Job. That comes out in verse 6. So that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for he is manifold in understanding. That manifold, incidentally, literally means to be doubled over or to be many-sided. Uh, what he is saying is, Job, God's wisdom has many layers in it, and it's not very easy to penetrate it or to understand it. And there's almost an implication in what he's saying in the way he says it, that I have an idea of something of this manifold, this many-sided, this um, multi-layered wisdom of God but I don't think that you know too much about it. But if you listen to me, then maybe you will learn something from it. And you see, his final jab to Job was that Job was getting less than what he deserved. The last part of verse 6, he says, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. And this is the, the problem that Job has with his friends and his friends have with him. And they 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 keep feeling that the only way that Job could have all the suffering come upon him that he's having come upon him was is because of his the intensity of the sin that he has. Then Zophar goes on and he praises God's wisdom from verses 7 down um, to verse 10 and um, um, down to verse 12 actually. And this is what he says uh, reading from verse 7. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? It is deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? For he knows worthless men. When he sees iniquity, will he not consider it? But a stupid man will get understanding when a wild donkey's cult is born a man. Um, now, in this praise of God's wisdom, he, he starts off by asking two questions, that both of which have a negative answer. The first question is, can you find out the deep things of God? And the answer, according to um, to Zophar is no. And then he asks the second question, can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Can you really know God to the full extent that it would be possible to know Him? And once again, the answer is no. God is just too big for us. And then Zophar speaks of the dimensions of God's wisdom. He says they're higher than the heavens on the one, one side and, um, and they're deeper than Sheol on the other side. And um, and then he says, and it measures longer than the earth in terms of length, and it's broader than the sea. And of course, he was talking about the uh, the two seas that they knew at that time, the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, from land, they couldn't see the end of it. And even when they got on their boats and they sort of sailed around the shorelines that, that they were able to sail around in those days, they could see no limit to the sea. It was huge. And he, what he's saying is, this is God's dimension of, of his wisdom. This is how big it is. Then he, he states that no one can reverse the summons, the verdict of the court, um, when the case is presided over by God. And you remember what James uh, got to court and have God explain to him the and make clear to him the confusion that Job, Job felt about what was happening. And um, and so he he makes this this comment. He says in verse ten, if he passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? You see, God is just too big for us. His verdict, nobody can change. And basically, what Job was feeling is that he needs to change this verdict. 
that God has come to in terms of the reason for him being judged. But then what happens is he goes on and he says this, that God's wisdom makes it impossible for him to be deceived by man. Um, God knows worthless men, verse 11. When he sees iniquity, will he not consider it? You can do what you like, but you cannot hide your iniquity from God. His wisdom is just too great. He will find you out. And then he adds a proverb. A proverb. And um, it read, we read this in verse 12. But a stupid man will get understanding when a wild donkey's cult is born a man. And really what he's saying is that the, a stupid man has about as much chance of understanding the wisdom of God as the cult of a wild donkey has of producing a man or the, the cult being a man. And, um, and that's, uh, I think the meaning of that is fairly obvious. He was saying to Job, you know, as long as you're being stupid, you've got no chance of understanding God's wisdom. Because, and, and incidentally, just by the way, a donkey, a wild donkey was considered to be, by the people of that day, one of the most stupid and foolish animals around. So this is basically what the argument really is. And then Zophar goes on, finally, in the last part of this chapter, to plea to Job to repent. And we read this from verses 13 to 21. And this is what um, Job says. If you prepare your heart, or sorry, this is what Zophar says to Job. If you prepare your heart, you will stretch out your hands towards him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away. And let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and will not fear. You will forget your misery. You will remember it as waters that have passed away. And your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like morning. And you will feel secure because there is hope. You will look around and take your rest in security. You will lie down and none will make you afraid. Many will court your favor, but the eyes of the wicked will fail. The way of escape will be lost to them and their hope is to breathe their last. This is, um, um, these are quite strong words with which this man ends his rebuke to, to Job. And, and, and here he says, plea, he's saying, please, while there's time, I want you to repent. Because if you do, then the sin that you've committed, whatever it is, once you confess it, once you make it known, it will be remembered no more. It will be like waters that have just passed away, washed on. You, you know, when you, when you see a river and when you walk through a river, the minute you've walked through that river, that water's gone. It's passed on. It's flowed down towards the sea. And if you turned around and walked through the river again, it's basically a different river that you're walking through because the water's gone, the sand has all moved and been washed further on. And he's saying, and this is what so far he's saying to Job. He's saying, Job, deal with this sin, man. Just deal with it and let it go. You know, don't let the, the uh, if there's iniquity in your hand, put it far away. Don't let injustice dwell in your tents and so on. Because if you do that, Job, then it's going to wash away and it will be remembered no more. And um, uh, he says, but the eyes of the wicked will fail. All way of escape will be lost to them. And their hope is to breathe their last. Job, if you don't repent, you've got no hope. The only thing you can do is lie down, breathe your last, and die. Now, we're going to, next week, we're going to have a look at Job's response to this. See how he handles this kind of criticism that came his way from Zophar. But in the meantime, let's just ask the Lord to give us understanding and, uh, and just help us to not to be like this to others. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to understand what you really want us to do. You don't want us to keep 
a whole record of people's wrongs and, and all the laws that they've broken and that are against them. And Lord, and yeah, this man, um, Zophar, <clears throat> can actually quote the extent of your judgment and, and the things that you've got against um, people. But Lord, I just pray that you would help us to remember the dimensions of your love when we deal with other people. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.